All right, folks, and welcome to our Zoner Lecture. Glad you all are joining us tonight. I am officially off mute. Brilliant. <laughs> all right, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the third in the Highlands Biological Foundation Zoner Conservation Lecture Series for 2021. This year, we are hosting the lectures in a variety of formats and spaces, including virtual. So thank you for joining us here on Zoom tonight. My name is Paige Engelbrexen, and I am the Nature Center Education Specialist. Together with Charlotte Muir, our Executive Director, we will be supporting the lecture tonight. As you will know, we work for the Highlands Biological Foundation, which supports research in the Southern Appalachians, like that of tonight's speaker, who the foundation supported every year that he was here at the station. We also support educational programming like this Sonar Conservation Lecture Series, which began in the 1930s and focuses on natural history and conservation. Many thanks to Francis and Avi Oakley for supporting this week's lecture. Today's lecture is being recorded and technology permitting will be available on our YouTube page. You can also find videos of our 2021 Zonar lectures as well as other virtual programming there and we'll drop the link in the chat. I am pleased to introduce Philip Gold, our speaker for tonight. Philip is a PhD candidate in the lab of Dr. Bill Peterman at Ohio State University, where he has investigated the ecological role of stream salamanders in the Southern Appalachians. His research has focused on identifying patterns in stream salamander abundance, evaluating how black-bellied salamanders influence aquatic ecosystems through diet and nutrient cycling, and how wildfires affect salamander populations. Much of the work he has done for his dissertation was supported and based out of Highlands Biological Station between 2017 and 2020. Philip, over to you. All right, thanks very much, Paige. Uh, what a wonderful introduction. And um, I'm very happy and proud to be able to present some of the work that I've done here in uh, Highlands or based out of Highlands tonight uh, as part of the Zonor Lecture Series. So uh, let me go ahead and share my presentation screen and we can go ahead and get started. So as Paige mentioned, uh, this is the virtual lecture. I, I'm, I wish that I could have been able to present this in person because I know just how much fun we can have uh, at these honor lectures in person, but I'm very thankful for all of you who come to listen to me talk online today. And even without the wine or cheese spreads, uh, we will be able to enjoy a learning a little bit about salamanders, conservation, and how animals connect ecosystems. So, my talk today is really going to focus on some of the research that I've done uh, investigating how salamanders connect aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems, but also include examples in the animal kingdom more broadly to really underscore the importance of how animals connecting ecosystems and how they can do that through diet, distribution, and, and other patterns in, in their ecology. So, First and foremost, I want to establish what an ecosystem is. Many of you are probably familiar with the term ecosystem, whether it be aquatic or marine, terrestrial, like this forest ecosystem, or some composite of multiple ecosystems interacting in close quarters with one another. But strictly speaking, an ecosystem is a community of living organisms, their physical environment, and how those organisms interact with one another and their environment. And those patterns and processes in those interactions result in what we can go and observe. So where animals occur, the communities that they exist within, and of course the interactions between animals within their communities. One interesting thing about ecosystems is they're not always in uh, by themselves. In fact, ecosystems are often connected to one another in either one direction where we can see aquatic resources moving to terrestrial ecosystems, for example, in this figure, we might think about those birds flying down and eating fish and then taking them back to feed their young on land. Uh, terrestrial ecosystems subsidizing aquatic ecosystems. So if leaves fall into rivers or streams, that can act in one direction. But more often, it's, it's some combination of both where we see that energy and resources are moved from one ecosystem to another. And then at different times of year, and in different conditions, we see that there, the direction of those energy subsidies changes or uh, the amount in, in one direction or the other. It's very important that we identify these connections because when we don't fully understand how ecosystems are connected, 
our management in one ecosystem can have unintended consequences on the quality or stability of another ecosystem. So if we were to try to manage for the forest resources on land by harvesting timber without properly understanding how those are connected to other ecosystems, we may not realize that we're, we're putting at risk the natural resources of other ecosystems. So what I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about today are some of the processes within ecosystems, including things like the carbon cycle, which we learned about in, in ecology classes in high school, maybe. Um, really this talk is gonna focus on the role of consumers. So in the middle of this figure, the higher level consumers, so, and primary consumers, which are foraging and uh, eating and then moving around on the landscape. Additionally, the process is like nitrogen cycle where again, animals consume uh, carbon or nitrogen and then retain that nitrogen within their tissue and then release that nitrogen either through excretion, which is predominantly what I've investigated with salamanders, but also through carcass deposition or just retaining it over a longer period of time in their, in their tissue. And finally, also, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about how animals and specifically salamanders can cycle phosphorus, which is often a limited nutrient in aquatic ecosystems. And I'm going to give a few examples of how the cycling of these limited resources and nutrients uh, play a role in, the, <clears throat> in these ecosystems. So the majority of the talk today is going to be focused on cross ecosystem linkages. These are processes that connect or subsidize ecosystems. So I described how ecosystems can be connected to one another. And, and most often we're thinking about cross ecosystem linkages. Uh, these can be facilitated by animals like the bear in the picture on the right, uh, but it doesn't have to be. Now my talk will feature mostly examples describing how animals connect ecosystems, but it's important to understand that climate and physical processes can connect ecosystems as well. So in this seminal paper that really set out to describe how aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems were linked, these authors suggested that meteorological or climate and weather patterns influence ecosystem linkages, geological or hydrological and physical processes like gravity influence the deposition of resources from one ecosystem to another. It's important to think about how water might move resources downstream that has pretty broad implications on water quality, which is why it's important for us to think about the conservation of upstream headwater systems as compared to you know, how that might influence river systems downstream. And finally, biological processes can influence the uh, movement and, and foraging of resources from one ecosystem and the deposition of another. So in this figure on the right, we see that grizzly bears at the very bottom move salmon derived resources over relatively short distances from rivers and streams that those salmon swim in. But if we consider how emergent insects from those same rivers might move resources, they can move them considerably farther based on species traits or how large the insects are, or in, in the case of bats, how those insect resources are getting to the forest ecosystem. So these are all some of the things that I think about when I'm discussing how salamanders play a role, but it's important to note that it's not just salamanders that are performing these, these processes and functions. And as I mentioned before, but uh, it bears repeating, it's really important that we understand how our actions might influence ecological connections between different ecosystems. So whether we're altering the hydrological flow path of a river by, inputting, by <clears throat> putting in a dam, or we're altering the harvesting of timber from uh, headwater streams, it's important that we understand how the impacts of our actions in one ecosystem might have broader, more <clears throat> holistic impacts on alternative ecosystems that we may not actually be evaluating. So with that, it's incredibly complicated and we don't necessarily have the ability to identify every pathway over which ecosystems are connected, but sometimes we can identify, especially within the biological connections, specific groups of animals that might connect ecosystems more than others. So the first example I want to give is from some research out of uh, in Africa studying the Mara River system and how wildebeest connect Serengeti Plains ecosystems with these large river ecosystems, which often have very complex uh, biodiverse communities of, of 
uh, animals within them. So to give a little background, wildebeest navigate the Serengeti Plains through an annual migration. Along that migration path, they feed in these grass plains of the Serengeti and at different times of year have to ford rivers. And these river crossings can be pretty significant challenges for large groups of wildebeest, uh, resulting in sometimes they're, they're dying within the water or being preyed upon by larger carnivores. So the Mara River, which is at the top of this figure, is a significant river crossing that occurs in the summer months between July and September. So right about now, actually, would be when the annual migration of uh, wildebeest is occurring. So as these wildebeest are migrating and having to cross the Mara River, they, as I said, they come across some significant challenges. So one challenge is that there are predators within these aquatic ecosystems like crocodiles. These crocodiles can result in the direct mortality of wildebeest, which in itself is depositing then a large amount of terrestrial resources into this aquatic system because that wildebeest is made up of mostly terrestrial carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, which it's consumed from these plains ecosystems. In addition to crocodiles, and perhaps even more problematic for wildebeest, are mass drowning events. These events are where large numbers of wildebeest are crossing the river at the same time and compete with one another to the point where they get exhausted, and some number of them will drown within the river depositing a large density of carcasses all in one place. And so within those carcasses, as I said before, are nutrients that would not have originally gotten to that aquatic ecosystem if not for the wildebeest moving them there, all right? So that's sort of the principle we're thinking about. What is in the tissue of that wildebeest and, and where was it originally, where's it coming from? Uh, because it's really important for that river ecosystem to get this subsidy every year. In addition to wildebeest, we also have hippopotami. So some behaviors of hippopotami, like the one in the picture here, are these you know, fantastical excretion uh, events where they try to uh, show their territoriality. You may have seen this at, at your local zoo uh, if, you, if, you get, if you have hippopotami there. Um, but it's important to note that, that they live in these river ecosystems year round and they live in fairly dense pods of hippos where you can have large numbers and, and densities and biomass of hippos and subsequently hippo excretion, right? Because it's not just that they poop a lot or pee a lot, they're a large mammal. And so they have to uh, excrete and that excretion is often occurring within the water. Now they may be foraging both in aquatic ecosystems on plants, but also on land. And so this represents a sort of shorter distance movement of resources between different ecosystems. So together, researchers investigated how hippo and wildebeest nutrients were being utilized within the Mara River. And they found that hippos represented a short-term seasonally stable resource, and that's predominantly from excretion from hippos. Now that excretion is a slightly different form than the carcasses that wildebeest deposit, and it's more accessible to plants for um, uptake from their roots. So it actually may be a different, equally useful resource than what we see with wildebeest, which is that they are often depositing carcasses those are generally seasonal. As I said, they were really only being uh, present between July and September. And those represent much longer term storage of resources because even if the tissue from the wildebeest carcass breaks down or is consumed over the course of a few weeks, the bones of those wildebeest will remain over a long period of time. And it's important to note, though I won't spend much time on it, the these events where wildebeest drown or cross the river are not necessarily random across the landscape. Uh, so it's important to think about how these processes can be uh, present spatially within the river because some areas may have larger densities of hippo or wildebeest nutrients than others. And so these researchers and, and 
thinking about some of the research I've done from the landscape ecology perspective is the idea that it's important for us to understand why patterns are occurring within the landscape. So this map sort of displays where these river crossings are. And we can see at the very bottom, there happens to be a large number of drownings. Uh, so perhaps that is because the uh, physical characteristics of the river there are not very conducive for wildebeest to cross, um, or there could be other uh, unknown factors influencing. And finally, it's important to understand where those nutrients end up. So just because wildebeest happen to die within rivers doesn't mean that's useful to the aquatic ecosystem. We want to understand where those nutrients go and how they're used. This figure, albeit a little busy, I'll try to break it down for you, uh, does a pretty decent job of that. So if we look at the gray arrows, we can see that the gray arrows represent the carbon from those wildebeest carcasses. And the largest amount of carbon is actually leaving to the atmosphere. It's or going in and being retained within bones over a long period of time. So we see that only a smaller percentage is being transported downstream via water um, or consumed by predators or detritivores like vultures. On a, from the blue arrows representing nitrogen here, we can see that the majority of the nitrogen is actually consumed by predators or fish or other detritivores that live in the water. And so it's important to note that carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus don't necessarily move the, to the same degree via these similar processes. And phosphorus can often be in aquatic ecosystems. And the phosphorus here within wildebeest is majority of it is retained within the bones of these animals, which as you can imagine, is in that system for a much longer period of time, but it's released at a much slower rate. And so identifying where nutrients go and how they're consumed is also incredibly important if we're going to sort of try to describe the implications of management that might limit, for example, where wildebeest can cross the river. Um, that's not something that's being proposed right now, as far as I know, uh, but it's something that's important to think about. All right, so those are just a few examples of this Serengeti Plains Mara River wildebeest system. Let's come back to North America. So let's let's take it slightly a step down in how large an area these animals are moving through and perhaps the size of individual animals. And I want to talk about how salmon in Alaska connect marine ecosystems to both aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems inland. So this, for those of you that are familiar with salmon uh, life history or biology, you might be familiar with many species of salmon being considered anadromous, which means they swim from, they spend the majority of their life growing as an adult offshore in marine ecosystems, but they swim inland up rivers and streams to breed and spawn. Many species of salmon, including populations of sockeye salmon, breed only one time in their life. And as a consequence, after they've bred, they die. And their carcasses remain within these stream e and river ecosystems where they breed. So this has led researchers to trying to answer the question of what's the value of those resources that those salmon are bringing to these ecosystems? Are they being utilized or fertilizing aquatic or terrestrial ecosystems around these breeding natal sites? Or is it simply you know, that these carcasses are going to waste and they're not really doing much? And so a team of researchers from the University of Washington set out to see how de depositing salmon carcasses after they've bred in these streams on land influenced the growth of near stream trees. And what they found was, as you can imagine, Salmon uh, being deposited into the forest floor near these rivers resulted in those trees growing significantly more over a 20 year period than in the parts of the forest where they weren't depositing those carcasses. So as much as we often think about the environmental impacts of fertilizers and runoff from an ag agricultural perspective, it's important to note that within a natural system, we can have these analogs to fertilization and they're often very important. 
We just maybe don't appreciate them yet. And that's what the science is here to, to tell us. In another study, which came before that, uh, we, scientists found that nitrogen, which they traced from these salmon using a tool called stable isotopes, uh, was found in trees, not only within 25 meters of streams, but also at greater distances than 25 meters away from streams. So their findings suggest that the salmon, which themselves cannot even leave the river, are somehow ending up in the tissue and leaves of trees at greater than 25 meters away from these rivers. So to me, that's really interesting and exciting. Within 25 meters, in streams that salmon are breeding in, there's significantly more growth. The trees are growing much faster. And the, in fact, that is almost four times the uh, amount of growth in, within 25 meters when you compare it to streams that don't have salmon. So the implications for the movement of marine resources into aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems surrounding these spawning grounds can be pretty profound. And as I described before, when we alter the flow paths and the breeding paths that these salmon are swimming in, um, either through dams or other forms of, of alterations to river systems, we have to think more broadly than just the implications on the species itself or the ecosystem where that species breeds. It's important to consider what those implications might be for the terrestrial ecosystems that surround those rivers. And I think it's also interesting, and this isn't necessarily something that's been proven, but some researchers have hypothesized that as a result of salmon depositing their carcasses where they're breeding, they're actually sort of contributing to the health and quality of terrestrial resources that their juveniles are feeding on. So it's sort of this beautiful circle of life that, you know, the adult salmon are spawning, dying, and then really still contributing to the growth and development of their young. As I said, that research is, is certainly there, but I don't know if people have, have really established that relationship. And as I think the ultimate picture here is that these trees, which salmon themselves cannot directly swim up to, are utilizing nutrients that these salmon have acquired from great distances away in totally disparate ecosystems. In the ocean, these salmon are feeding, but they're eventually that those nutrients and resources are ending up in the tissue of trees, you know, hundreds or even thousands of miles away. So that to me is just super cool. Uh, and finally, so, okay, I talked about uh, wildebeest and salmon and the title of this talk and my research has spent so much time focusing on salamanders. So how can I connect the dots between these large plains ungulates, these uh, big commercially viable piscivorous fish and semi-aquatic salamanders, which are, you know, locally to highlands, very abundant and very relevant as a cultural resource. But they're smaller, of course, than a wildebeest, uh, and they don't move quite as far as, a, as salmon. So, so how can a, a salamander really play a role in that? And I want to break that down a little bit here because I think they can, and I hope that I can prove they can. Uh, so first and foremost, for the relevance here to highlands is that in the, <clears throat> in the Southern Appalachians, we have the global biodiversity hotspot of plethodontid salamanders. These are lungless salamanders that breathe through their skin exclusively. And many of the species around highlands, in fact, the majority are uh, of this group, of this family. So it's really important re regionally in terms of the biodiversity of salamanders here. And again, as I mentioned, the unique physiology of plethodontid salamanders is also something that plays a role in almost all of the processes that we can observe relating to abundance or occupancy. Because as you can imagine, anything that limits your ability to breathe, whether it's using lungs like we do or through their skin, is going to have a fairly profound impact on where you spend your time, how many of you can be there, and what the diversity of animals that might be present is. So 
Cutaneous respiration, or again, breathing through skin, is not unique only to salamanders of the family Plethodontidae. However, when we focus just at the bottom of that figure, where we see hellbenders, which are the regional charismatic species of salamander, and lungless salamanders, or plethodontid salamanders, we see that almost all of the respiration that they're doing is through their skin. And so when we compare that to other species, we see that they may not be as sensitive to things limiting cutaneous respiration because they have alternative mechanisms, whether that is through their lungs um, or you know, cloacal respiration or what have you. So what then might be influencing, or how does this sort of uh, cutaneous respiration, and as we remember with amphibians, really prioritizing water. So how might water loss influence an animal's uh, ecology, we see that individual animal size can have a fairly profound influence on uh, water loss rates and their ability to stay active on land, which ultimately influences their foraging habits, where they're spending their time, as well as, you know, searching for mates and things like that. And then also elevation. So as you can imagine, for those of you who are regional to our local to highlands, um, but if you're not local to highlands and you spend time in the mountains, you might appreciate going to higher elevations generally results in cooler temperatures. And here in the Southern Appalachians, that's often also related with uh, more moist, uh, humid conditions. So just as we like to go to highlands to escape some of the heat of the uh, Atlanta or the, the local area, we also, salamanders are able to be more active at those highest elevations because of those differences in temperature uh, and humidity patterns. So I spent my time in this project I'm going to describe focused on black-bellied salamanders. So I wanna give you a little pitch here for why I think you should go and look in the stream for black-bellied salamanders if you are uh, in the region. But black-bellied salamanders are the largest salamander within uh, headwater streams. So not including those streams with fish um, where hellbenders are certainly the largest. Um, so black-bellied salamanders are locally quite large and they can be fairly abundant. They're also pretty charismatic, I think. Um, they have these wonderfully big buggy eyes and they're uh, quite you know, interesting if you flip them over, as their name would suggest, they have a jet black belly. Uh, so they're really, really quite interesting and they're fairly widespread. They occur throughout most of the Southern Appalachians, throughout the Smokies, they're quite common. And so uh, they're a great study system if we're investigating what their role might be in their ecosystems because they, they occur over fairly large areas. So any conclusions we make here might translate to a decent chunk of the Southern Appalachians uh, if we find those patterns hold across their range. So first I wanna talk about how salamanders might be influencing these links between terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. So I established how wildebeest can do it, how salmon can do it, but how can a salamander? So within streams that have fish, Salamanders may function both as prey, those purple arrows, and predators, the red arrows. So in this example, we see that where we have larger fish or small mammals like otters, um, but that can also include things like raccoons or, or other uh, species of mammals that are more associated with water, uh, they can function as predators of salamanders, both on the adults and the larval forms. In addition, salamanders themselves can function as predators on a whole host of macroinvertebrates within aquatic ecosystems, but also macroinvertebrates in terrestrial ecosystems. That's including flying macroinvertebrates that have either emerged from streams or developed on land, as well as uh, other non-flying macroinvertebrates like ants or worms or other things that, that are originally sourced from terrestrial ecosystems. When we focus just on Appalachian high headwaters, uh, so my study system and those streams that are pretty much all around highlands in the region, we see that without those predatory fish or small mammals, salamanders are pretty much at the top of that food chain. Uh, there aren't very many predators within the streams themselves that are, that are specializing on salamanders. Uh, that being said, of course, species like birds and other uh, animals can spend, uh, will eat salamanders, but they're not really, we're, we're kind of chopping that part of the trophic system off for a second. So these salamanders are really important to the uh, 
the way the food web here within aquatic and terrestrial systems. And more so than almost any other species that lives in headwaters, they have this potential role to bring nutrients in. And that's what I wanted to investigate. As I established before, Black-bellied salamanders are often incredibly abundant. So this is a picture that we took from uh, a stream just on Rich Gap Road off of uh, off Highlands. Uh, and this was uh, as part of a class based out of Highlands where we were able to find all these black-bellied salamanders in a fairly small area. And this just represents a diversity of sizes and abundance of these animals within the system. In addition, Black-bellied salamanders are, the, as I said, the largest species. And I, it's really important that we emphasize just the difference that can occur. So these three animals here are all adults of their respective species, the black-bellied seal and a coey salamander. And so if we are considering the black belly, we can understand how it might be more competitive than some of those other species that are smaller because it can actively kind of, uh, be an antagonist against those smaller species that are trying to vie for similar resources. So black-bellied salamanders, as a consequence, are able to utilize aquatic ecosystems more often, and they tend to spend their time in, in and around aquatic ecosystems more frequently than some of these other small species that they're out competing. On the right is actually a figure based on some data that we've collected on uh, just based on our observations of salamanders, where we see that as salamanders get larger, as black-bellied salamanders increase in size, the L term, uh, they are spending less time in water. Now, the largest salamanders are still spending the majority of their time in water, just a little bit, but we can see that in the smaller animals, they're spending you know, upwards of 60 to 90% of their time in contact with water. So it's a, this is a very small data set, but it does tell us that this probability of being in water is related to size too. So this led us to the question of how do salamanders connect aquatic and terrestrial food webs through diet? So are these salamanders consuming predominantly aquatic prey, like the crane fly on the left-hand side of this slide, or are they, they're consuming more terrestrial prey, like this ant on the right side? And what we, so to do this, we set out uh, using stable isotope tracers, as I briefly talked about before, to basically see what percentage of that animal's tissue is made up of aquatic or terrestrial prey. So this figure on the right sort of is uh, all the dots are the different animals that we collected little tail clips from um, and reminding that salamanders can grow back their tails. So this is a non-lethal method of uh, collecting data that's interesting and inform informative to us. Um, and on the left, we see some examples of this predatory behavior where we see at the top hand of that figure is a salamander that I've um, lavaged its stomach with water and it's actually regurgitated a larval black-bellied salamander. So there is some cannibalism in this species, uh, although it's not super common. Um, and then on the bottom, we see, you know, a typical sit and wait behavior where these salamanders will sit in burrows and poke their heads out and wait for invertebrates to fly or crawl in front of them, and then they consume them. So again, we utilize stable isotopes as a method to describe what proportion of that salamander tissue is made up of aquatic or terrestrial resources. And what we found was 5 to 8 percent of a salamander's diet is predominantly ter is terrestrial. And then a little bit under 50 percent on average, or really about 30 to 50 percent, is aquatic. So on average, these salamanders are consuming more terrestrial than aquatic prey. Well, how does that relate then to the patterns I described before, where we know that size and elevation might influence an animal's ability to spend time on land and consequently might influence its diet? Well, what we found was as animals increased in size, they're consuming almost exclusively terrestrial prey. So this is a figure showing us as the diet proportion of aquatic prey. So that number going down is telling us that it's consuming less aquatic and consequently more terrestrial prey. And so what we're seeing here is that that high elevation, the red band, is actually consuming more terrestrial prey uh, than the mid or low elevation sites. 
which tells us that even at smaller sizes, the elevation seems to be alleviating some of the challenges these animals face uh, when trying to consume terrestrial prey. Um, but I think it's really interesting here because this connects to some of the uh, patterns we know to be associated with size, like excretion. And this leads us to these really interesting findings. So overall, we found that there's a net import of resources from forests to streams via black-bellied salamanders. Some previous work that I did, again, here in the region, um, and in part around highlands, we looked at how black-bellied salamanders um, excrete nitrogen and phosphorus. And we know that there's a really strong relationship where larger animals excrete more, which is fairly logical. Um, we see now, when we connect those dots, that approximately 89% of the nitrogen that salamanders are excreting and 80% of the phosphorus is coming from terrestrial-derived nutrients. So I think that does a really wonderful job displaying the fact that this really unique set of species where they can spend time in land and in water um, are doing a terrific job connecting these ecosystems and that that's really coming from the terrestrial environment and going to the aquatic environment. So maybe I've sold you on the idea that these small, really uh, not super mobile species can connect ecosystems in a similar way to salmon or wildebeest as I described before. Uh, so what's next? Well, it's important to remember that black-bellied salamanders are only one species of a diverse community of semi-aquatic and terrestrial salamanders uh, endemic to the, the Southeast Appalachians all around highlands. So, if we think that you know, some percentage of the nutrients that black bellies are meeting are coming from terrestrial ecosystems, well, we should try to set out to identify you know, the role of other animals and other species within these communities. Because when we begin to gain a better, more comprehensive understanding of how the community as a whole is connecting ecosystems, I think we can make a very compelling argument from a conservation standpoint for in increasing our perception of their value. And ultimately, at the beginning of my graduate program, I wanted to be able to answer the, the question of, you know, what's the ecological value or role of the black-bellied salamander? And this is just a little piece of that. Ultimately, you know, it's very difficult to quantify what the role of anything is. Uh, so this is just one little snippet of that. And so even more terrestrial species, like the gray cheek salamander there in the middle, which of course we have a whole bunch of around highlands, or the red cheek salamander, which is native to the Smokies, um, even those species, though they don't spend time in water, might still be facilitating these cross ecosystem linkages. When we consider the fact that they spend so much time underground, and so if they're consuming prey on top, on the surface, on the forest floor, or whether that's flying or crawling prey, and then they're excreting that prey in this deep, deeper into the soil, that may represent a more direct quantity of nutrients to the subterranean environment. Though again, those processes are currently underappreciated. Ultimately though, so what, right? I, I'm sure there are a few of you sitting here that are like, okay, well, that's really cool. I've learned a little bit about salamanders and a couple of other species and how they can connect ecosystems. Where does this leave us with the, you know, why does this matter? Well, here in the Southern Appalachians, which is where I'll feature most of these uh, examples, we know that there's an incredible economic value to the natural resources. Uh, just on outdoor recreation alone, not, uh, there, the economies of the region around Nanahale and Pisgah National Forests uh, earn about $115 million, all right? So how does the salamander come into that? Well, the quality and quantity of water resources can certainly be influenced by the integrity of headwater streams where these salamanders are occurring. And so better understanding and identifying critical processes occurring in headwater streams can have fairly broad implications on the quality of uh, downstream resources. And any sort of management that's occurring around these headwater streams, whether that be timber harvesting or other processes occurring in the region, needs to be able to appreciate that it may not be just the stream corridor that's connecting these ecosystems, but actually it, there, we may need to think a little more broadly. 
As I established before, this research was done within the U.S. Forest Service, uh, Nantahala National Forest. The Forest Service has a multi-use mandate uh, that indicates that forest resources are managed for a number of reasons. Uh, of course, one of the more obvious and salient reasons is for timber growth and harvesting, which is an incredible economic boon to the region and has uh, implications for funding of public school systems and other programs here in the Southern Appalachians. In addition to timber harvesting, recreational opportunities like uh, managing for value, or scenic value of the Appalachian Trail are incredibly important as well as, of course, the natural resources and biological integrity that I've described here, these types of uh, processes as well. So adding research that continues to support the relevance and the role of species in these systems is essential to effective management. Because if we don't understand how salamanders or other species are connecting ecosystems, we may inadvertently alter one ecosystem um, without realizing. In the face of management decisions like timber harvesting or mining, um, we have also natural disturbances like wildfire on the right. That's a picture from a study we've done on Wyabald where there were significant fires in 2016. And then in the middle, you know, the implications on water quality, it's really important for us to have the best data possible. Now, again, establishing that black-bellied salamanders connect ecosystems is not going to immediately change the policy of these practitioners, but it's going to better inform the scientists who are making these decisions. And, and each step, we can begin to provide management recommendations as it relates to the science and ecology of the species we're interested in. And finally, here in the Southern Appalachians, as well as all over the United States, there is predicted to be uh, increased development of urban and exurban landscapes uh, going into the future. So if you focus on the Piedmont Atlantic region, that region is expected to, to experience significant development in the next 50 years. And when we overlay a map of species richness and diversity of amphibians, we begin to see some challenges that managers might face going into the future. More so than almost any other portion of America or any of these other urban development corridors, we see that the Piedmont Atlantic Corridor puts at risk a diversity of amphibians uh, that we know and value today. So gaining information about the value of those animals or species as well as the diversity of animals that occur there is essential to effective management in the future where we expect changes in land cover to occur. And so, you know, this is something that might seem really broad, but it is something that's important to appreciate. These are expected changes. This is a figure that, you know, came out a few years ago that I think a lot of people have, have taken as, as really some of the best science. And finally, we understand the impacts of climate change. So this figure, again, is showing us how animals are expected to move as a result of climate change, tracking uh, their climate niche, which is uh, sort of imagine where the salamanders live now and they want to follow those same conditions as climate changes. Well, we see a significant corridor here in the Appalachians, especially again in the Southern Appalachians, where species are able to track these changes in climate more effectively because of differences in topography and mountains. So this figure came out a few years ago. I love it. I think it's a beautiful figure, but I also think it does a really good job of displaying some of the broad scale implications of climate change as it relates to the Appalachians and, uh, you know, the and, and land to ensure that we are able to allow wildlife to pass through these, uh, these habitats and ecosystems. So, okay, I'm not gonna leave you with a sense of doom and gloom and dread because that's, you know, it's too easy to do in wildlife and conservation biology. And I don't necessarily think that's the best takeaway all the time. So what can I do or what can you do to engage with the environment in a productive way right now? Because it can be really challenging to overcome these broad scale, long time frame issues that we know and deal with or face every day. Uh, so first and foremost, you can engage with the environment in a good way, which means going out and not leaving a trace. Uh, these are examples of um, rock cairns or stacks of rocks that I, I think 
plague the Southeast and uh, particularly in streams and rivers. And as a salamander biologist, I, you know, I view this as a, a dramatic loss of cover here in this particular stream where I was uh, conducting a study. Some of the data I talked about today was from there. Uh, so it is, you know, important to leave no trace and, and try to uh, make the system better than when we found it. Uh, now, I'm not going to encourage you to take down these rock stacks because in some cases they are significant trail markers, particularly places where there are not a lot of trees. But here in the Southern Appalachians, that is less often the case. Um, in addition to, you know, engaging with the environment in a positive way, engaging with organizations in your specific uh, local region or more national organizations that you value. So organizations like the Highlands Biological Foundation and the station support research like what I've described to you here, but also support, you know, academic opportunities, community outreach that, that go a long way in terms of engaging the public and garnering that really positive outlook on the species that we have in our own backyard. In addition, organizations like the Highlands Cashers Land Trust participate in ensuring that land specifically is set aside for preservation and maintenance of ecosystems and communities of animals and plants that we value. And so don't feel like you can't necessarily do anything because there are certainly organizations that you may or may not be familiar with that align with your specific values. In addition to that, larger organizations like the Friends of Program for National Forests or National Parks are also important organizations, if, again, if for those who value those resources. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, going outside and engaging with the environment you know, is always something I find reinvigorating and encourage others to do. Uh, this is a simple picture from the Rufus Morgan Trail, which my colleague Megan, who's listening, will love. Um, but we've done some really wonderful research all along this trail, and it's a very little, you know, not super challenging trail just outside of Franklin, North Carolina. So for those of you who maybe haven't gone on that little trail and are in the region, I encourage you to do so. It's fairly rewarding. There's a nice waterfall at the top of it. Uh, and you may see some salamanders on your way. Uh, so, you know, I, I always remind myself that it's, it's important to get back to those roots. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody who was able to participate in this uh, webinar today. I'm really very thankful for being able to give, provide some of my research and talk about some of this work. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. I wanna thank Highlands Biological Station, of course, both for uh, asking me to uh, present today, but also for supporting my research over the past four or five years. Um, and some of the research here, particularly um, the isotopes uh, and diet analysis I described was supported by a grant from North Carolina Herpetological Society. So I wanna thank them as well um, and my home institution of Ohio State. So thank you and I'm happy to take any questions. All right. Thank you so much, Philip. I really appreciate you getting to hear that talk. And um, as we were saying before the webinar started, getting to see some of the research that the foundation supports come home in a sense. Um, we had a really interesting encounter before we get to some questions. By the way, drop questions in the Q&A or the chat and we will make sure that we get them answered. Um, we were putting up game camps with some campers two weeks ago and by a stream and just started flipping over rocks. And the next thing I know, the, one of our campers comes up to me and she's got a black belly in her hands. And then one of our counselors comes right behind her with a half digested gray cheek. It had oh, thrown up when wow. they picked it up. That is, uh, it, so small little anecdotes like that are, are what I always get really excited about. We've, we have found black-bellied salamanders, as I showed, regurgitating larval animals, um, though that is a little bit more well-documented, but we found an animal that regurgitated probably the better part of a, of a gray cheek salamander's tail. Um, I've never seen a fully regurgitated one, though. That's very interesting. Yeah, I, I failed to get a picture. I was too busy kind of ooing and awing and poking at it. So, speaking of finding salamanders, Lost Glazer is asking, what features of a stream make them the most likely place to find a salamander, and how does one try to see salamanders without disturbing them? That is a, a terrific question. Um, so I have studied sort of the broader characteristics of streams that influence 
how good they might be for salamanders. But I'm going to give you a little bit of my personal views. These ne aren't necessarily defended by the most scientific information. Um, but broadly, going up to, you know, mid elevation, so that is anywhere between maybe uh, 650, well, that's in meters, uh, like 2,000 feet and uh, 4,000 feet can be, you know, a great place to start. So on top of the highlands um, plateau is a great place to go looking for salamanders, uh, but also in, in the mountains. But that's just here in the Appalachians. More broadly, you can find salamanders in many small streams throughout the United States, particularly in the east. Um, within streams themselves, I'm always looking for a stream that has a lot of bedrock. Uh, so it's not very sandy. It's got a lot of different rock or um, pebble substrate. But you'll also find that these little seeps where you might have a little bit of water coming out of the side of a hill with some rock strewn under it can be incredibly productive areas to look for salamanders. At your second question in terms of disturbing salamanders, my personal view is, you know, I always encourage people to go and, and flip logs or rocks very safely. Uh, so ensure that you're putting them back the way you found them and really spend more time if you're going to flip things, taking pictures of the animals themselves, not necessarily disturbing them from the habitat you find them in. Um, but if you're looking to not disturb them at all, I encourage you to go out and participate in things like the Salamander Meander, where you can go out at night, uh, and that's a program here with the Biological Station um, I'm a big supporter of. Uh, you can go out at night and just look for them, and they'll be surface active, swimming around or standing near streams, and you won't have to flip anything. And you can do that about 9.30, really, whenever it gets dark, so take a flashlight. Yes, we um, actually would have had our very last salamander meander of the season this past Tuesday. We had to cancel due to lightning, but oh. yeah, check us out next summer and Tuesday nights, 9 p.m. We alternate our topics, but those are always a really popular one. Mm -hmm. um, I had a, a question that I was thinking of, Philip, while you were talking, which is, you mentioned that the black bellies are coming out more onto land as adults, and I, I was curious if you have any um, potential hypotheses about why. I was thinking maybe that when they're bigger, there's a decreased chance of predation, and uh, there's also a greater variety and available abundance of prey items for them when they reach a certain size. Yeah, so uh, I'll start with that, the last part there. So salamanders, as we scientists will say, are gape-limited predators, which simply means they can only eat what fits in their mouth. So the bigger they get, they can fit more things, right? Um, that being said, that is a great question that I think some of my colleagues and I have been trying to uh, figure out what the best explanation is, because there are certainly a number. Uh, one, of course, is that larger animals are more competitive, uh, so they can find that Goldilocks zone of being close to streams, but still on land or near streams. Um, but the other, and perhaps the, the best supported, is the idea that these animals as they get larger are more resilient to water loss. And so they don't need to spend quite as much time in and around uh, aquatic ecosystems. Um, other species of salamanders like the gray cheek salamander or even other species of, uh, within these stream systems are, they have adaptations that allow them to spend time on land because you know, they don't lose water as quickly. But for black bellies at least, it seems like these smaller animals don't spend quite as much time on land. And that may be the result of, of just the habitat quality being better for them uh, in terms of water loss. That makes an incredible amount of sense. <laughs> so, um, and folks, if you have a question that you don't feel like you can put into text adequately, raise your hand and we can try out a feature called allow to talk, where I can actually let you talk into your mic so you can say your question directly instead of trying to put all the nitty gritties into text. Nitty gritties, like one more question of mine. So you mentioned the, the different um, nutrients that the salamanders would be excreting in the stream system. And last week, Dr. Hillary Swain was talking about phosphorus in the mm -hmm. systems that she was looking at. So if the salamanders are excreting in the stream, what organisms may be able to take up those nutrients mm. and use them as opposed to just letting them slip yeah. by in the stream. And, and that was, for me, that was my several thousand dollar question that unfortunately I wasn't able to directly answer uh, during my PhD so far. Um, but 
essentially they're excreting a very labile or accessible form of ammo uh, nitrogen and ammonium and ammonia. And that is utilized by um, sort of the small amount of primary producers. There aren't a lot because they're heavily shaded streams so that they don't tend to get a lot of sun, uh, but also in um, used by microbes generally. So uh, these microbes will grow on leaves and condition them to make them a little easier to digest. Um, and, oh yes, please, there we go. Uh, so that is perhaps the, uh, like the more direct route that that phosphorus or nitrogen might be utilized by. But it sort of skips a step in the nitrogen cycle. If we remember back, you know, ammonium is a, a part of that cycle. So the salamanders putting that directly in is actually more useful in some cases to those ecosystems. Thank you. Um, speaking of being useful, I love using salamanders with kids. I think mm -hmm. I call them micro charismatic fauna. Um, and we have Kathy Olson who's saying, my grandchildren love to catch salamanders, which I have tried to discourage, though they are gentle. Is it okay for salamanders and kids to catch them in your hands? I am, uh, and this is not me speaking for the entire community of uh, salamander enthusiasts, but I certainly fall into the category that I believe Paige does. Um, there is, I would, in, if you're going to have children uh, catching and handling salamanders, it's really important that you just are teaching the best, you know, handling practices, which is, you know, hold them very gently. Uh, if you're going to hold them maybe close to the ground because they can be very wriggly and, and they, for kids especially, they might fall out of your hand. Um, the other thing, as with any amphibian, is to just ensure that you don't have, you know, hand sanitizers or other sort of um, uh, topical things on your hands that might potentially uh, get into their skin. But they're pretty resilient little animals. So especially these larger ones, I think they are a tool for conservation learning that we should be able to, you know, handle and show off quite well in the right setting. Yes, I had a graduate school cohort member who, whose family, um, she allowed her to catch salamanders, but then she would take them home in her pockets and forget about them. And she said it was one of the most memorable experiences and it helped her become the conservationist she is today, but also at the time those salamanders, it didn't end well for them. So yeah, definitely catch them. Wonderful example changes. of best practices, yes. yes. Um, and if anybody else has another question, please drop them into the chat or you have Philip's email. The last thing that I want to hit, unless anything else pops in, is a question. Um, what's it like to do research in Highlands? Wow, that is a wonderful question. Um, I'm not sure if anybody here is uh, in the position to have that opportunity, but if you are, I strongly encourage it. It is a wonderful place to spend the summer as a, uh, as a biologist. So, you know, the access to the natural resources and, and the study systems I've had in, in Highlands is just so it, important. And we would not have been able to accomplish anywhere near what we were, what we've done myself or my colleague, Megan, um, without the support of Highlands. The station itself is, uh, has great resources in the labs and uh, friendships with the people that have lived and having access to the outdoor resources when I'm not working that are around Highlands is second to none. All right, well, I think we're coming to the end of our Zoner lecture. So thank you very much to Philip for the fantastic lecture and lecture and all of your wonderful answers to our questions. And thank you to everybody else for joining us tonight. If you have any questions, uh, again, please make sure to email Philip. You should have his email address. If you'd like to support the foundation and the GIA funding that makes research like Philip's possible, you can become a member or make a donation on our website. We greatly appreciate all of your assistance. Um, you make things like this possible. And things like this also includes our futures on our lectures. So if you're looking to next week's, you can find all the details for next week's and the year on our website, including the locations. Again, we're holding these different places in different formats. And you can also stay up to date by signing up for eBlast, which is found on our website as well. 
For those of you just focusing on next week, our next honor lecture will be at the Highland Community Building, which is by the ballpark, with a reception to follow. Senior Carpenter of Canty Whirling Company and the Foundation will be speaking on nurturing life in your backyard. We hope to see you there if you're able to make it in person. If you are unable to attend, we are doing our best to make recordings of our in-person lectures, and they will be available on our YouTube page, which I'm throwing the link in the chat right now. Uh, you should be able to see the recording of this one, fingers crossed, there as well. So thank you all again for joining us. Have a fantastic evening and see you at the rest of our series. Take care.